<laughs> god damn it. Oh my god. I thought we had the setup down. Uh huh. Turns out we have to like move for any reason. Oh my god, it's just an asshole like that. Jesus fucking Christ. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Two uh, professional, thoroughly, <laughs> thoroughly prepared podcasters here. Thoroughly prepared podcasters, um, yeah. Who oh have God. not just spent the past 20 minutes trying to work out how they can precariously balance their <laughs> mics upon whatever semi-flat surfaces we can find. Yeah, yeah, listener, you thought that downstairs was uneven. <laughs> oh, boy, you haven't seen the upstairs. This is, for the listeners, uh, you're recording, right? Yes. For the listeners, uh, uh, <laughs> oh, <it's> understanding, <laughs> uh-huh. this is... More or less the same area that we recorded our Critique of the Gotha program episode in. It's not as hot. It's not so like 30 be a degrees, bit more lucid. So. <laughs> yeah. But we'll see. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. There's some ghosts up here, so you never know. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Boy. Oh, man. Well, I got my uh, winter crops ready to go, Dan. Uh-huh. I just showed nice. you my uh, elephant garlic, which I'm very excited about. It's a uh, patron saint of the episode. Uh, Charles Dowding uh, planted some a while ago, and I just like it because it just looks like big garlic. He's like, it, it's not as strong tasting. Who cares? It's big garlic. I just want big garlic. Okay. I want to impress people. He wants to grow the biggest crops. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. For the fair. Yeah, pretty much. Mm, this time next year, everybody will be marveling. <laughs> marveling. As opposed to the garlic you see over there, which is very tiny garlic hanging on the wall. Uh-huh. I only got tiny garlic this year. What are you going to do? Tiny ornamental garlic <laughs> hanging on Jack's wall. It's pretty much ornamental. Mm. Yeah. It's a conversation starter. What are you going to do? Yeah, all right. Oh, man. All right. Well, we're back. This one is uh, a little rushed. I think we're recording this. Is this a podcast first? Recording this a day before it goes out? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Oh, well, see when it actually goes out. But <laughs> yeah, assuming yeah, that right. it does go out on Friday. <laughs> well, I suppose regardless of what day it goes out. Today is Thursday. That is true. And you know what tonight is? Thursday night. Tonight, yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> is tonight, this a baseball thing? Tonight is another goddamn elimination game for oh the Dodgers. Oh my god, how does this... Oh, is it... Oh, yeah, so... So they... Did they lose it? So they lost the second game of the... So they lost two games yeah. and won two games. They There was an elimination how game they last managed year. To, like, know, like, like we, we spoke literally a few days ago, I exaggerate slightly, <laughs> and it was like game two, and now it's game five. <laughs> they're, just, they're just going for yeah. it. it uh, Somehow managed to play two games of baseball at once. Yeah, it is the third elimination game. In more or less what is, the pedants out there are going to say no, but the first round of the playoffs. So stress levels are a little high. Uh-huh. Um, you know, but, you know, it's t- starting at like 2 a.m. though, so I'm not going to watch uh-huh. it. I'm just going to wake up. We'll see. Find out. <laughs> find out. And the listeners will find out with us because this episode yeah. will go live. I don't know when I wake up, maybe. So there you go. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, they won't because we can't tell them. <laughs> well, they and won't. And they might be oh, at the right. part of the yeah. world where they could actually be watching. That's true. Yeah. So the listener yeah. perhaps knows. Our if they care to know, <laughs> they may well know. That's true. Our Cleveland Guardian fan listeners, who we, of, of whom we have many, I'm told. <laughs> um... Well, uh-huh. how know. are the Cleveland Guardians doing? Oh, they've, they've been out they for did a long not time. Make it. <laughs> they playoffs. No. With that logo, come on. Um, yeah, all right. Mm, yeah. You mean they didn't go for the two chats from Lord of the Rings? And the... <laughs> not. Shame. Damn shame. The Argonath. It's been said before, folks. It's been said before. Yeah, I'm just making the same joke. <laughs> wasn't even yeah, a well. joke, really. <laughs> I've been wondering, because I've realized I've made the same joke on multiple occasions, like the same jokes on multiple occasions during the show. I kind of wonder if we have like regular when enough listeners. When does it listeners? become endearing podcast sort <laughs> yeah. of like our familiar tropes and when is it just like... Um... It's an inside joke, right? <laughs> Not me just only having like two jokes. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, how, how, how like wide is the inside? <laughs> yeah, wide. You and I. Yeah, exactly. Are we the inside? Then, yeah. We are I would inside. hope so. I was thinking one of these days we should try and record outside, but that might be a bit of a mess. To, I don't know. <laughs> Just to be outside, I don't know. Okay. I gotta be inside all day. Um, oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm worried that... Let's get in a bit. Yeah, I don't know. You go and have a look. Have a look at it. It seems fine. I'm worried that something's going on. We're we just in the wrong place. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. It all feels wrong. It all feel, yeah, it feels very, very wrong. Oh, well. Uh, Such got, the two little bars are going. Yeah, the bars are going. It's ticking. It's red. So says, yeah. it's, says it's working. I mean, I thought we had it all down and then we recorded the baseball episode and my audio is just way out of whack. So now I'm a little like... It might have been my fault. No, it was me. No, it was <laughs> it's definitely me. <laughs> all right. Well, you know what, Dan? 
Let's quit faffing around. Let's get to it. We, uh, no, not last week. A couple weeks, weeks ago. ago. Two weeks ago, we did Revolutionary Strategy, and you had an idea to read something that was mentioned in that, kind of. What did we read? <laughs> <laughs> For this week's episode, as the listener well knows, we read Rosa Luxemburg's essay, The Mass Strike. I'm not entirely sure which year it is from. Sometime uh, after 1905. 1907, 1909. Post-1905 essay. Like um, 1906. Oh, okay. Hmm, I thought it was about kind of a while after 1905, hmm. but I guess not. Maybe hmm. maybe we read a later edition or who knows. Yeah. Um, with, as you, yeah, as you intimate, um, uh, with a view to um, expanding our understanding of what was referred to in reading Michael McNair's Revolutionary Strategy. Okay, well, let's read some a text that correlates to one of the tenants mm. or one of the, rather, one of the three um, streams of broad social democratic revolutionary thought as it existed at the beginning of the 19th century. 20th. 20th century. <laughs> um, so, yes. Rosa Luxemburg's The Mass Strike. Mm. Obviously, a key text of the Marxist left, yeah. as defined by Mike McNair. And I think as we talk about this, we ought and we will refer back to that text, but also use its framing or try and read this text in light of its framing and try and test, mm. um, see how faithful a representation Mike McNair does in his description of the Marxist left by us yeah. reading this, obviously just this one text. So obviously it is a partial, um, a partial like representation, representation of, of that yeah. stream of thought. Yeah, I think I always kind of fell into like, for a while, I, this is one of the first things that Rosa Luxemburg have, has written that I've ever read. And I think for a long time I fell into the like, Rosa Luxemburg's spontaneity. You hear Rosa Luxemburg and you just go, she's the spontaneity person and we write off spontaneity because spontaneity, dumb, let's actually do something. Um, and I, I was really impressed by this. I really, really liked this a lot. Um, I think it was exceedingly well written. But more than that, I think that the ideas that she comes to are not just, hey, everybody, hey, dude, let's just rely on spontaneity. And I think I found, I think whereas... You were definitely reading this with an eye to the McNair. I was reading this with a bit of like the an eye to like the Shlomo stuff that we read and the kind of like ideas of what can and can't be done um, without a movement and when the material circumstances aren't right. Um, and I found a lot of stuff in here that jived with that uh, stuff that we read with all of the kind of quotes that Shlomo used in that essay. Um, was it called The Limits of Political Revolution or something like that? Um, so I really, really liked it. And I think I came away from it with some questions and maybe like a few frustrations, but overall really impressed with like, I just suppose the ideas that are in here. And it seemed like, while there were some hiccups, I kind of can see from stuff that we've read so far, some kind of very clear um, through lines between Marx and her. And I dug it. I really, really dug it. And I suppose we should say, because you're bringing this up right before we started recording, and it's a really good point. Um, I think we need to do a little Rosa Luxemburg in context with this, um, uh, just because you were kind of saying, like, should we be treating this as like a historic document or as um, just like a political like playbook? And I think definitely it's historic. And I think she gets that. I think she understands that she's saying, hey, here's what 1905 has taught us. Um, and here's where we're at right now. You know, she makes constant references not to the world at large, but to the German Social Democrats. And I found that really refreshing. I think I, uh, yeah, I was just refreshed by all of this, I think I'll say. I like it a lot. Yeah, definitely. There is, obviously, Mike McNair's book is a book on strategy. Mm, sure. And yeah. therefore, there's a way to read this text as a um, statement on what appropriate social democratic strategy ought be primarily for the period of time when it was written. Yeah. <laughs> um, and obviously the historic context is vastly different and therefore you could not directly transpose that strategy into the present. And then, yeah, you're absolutely correct to say that um, 
it is in and of itself a very historic document in the sense that she's trying to rescue, almost rescue the idea of the mass strike from anarchist and Bakuninist associations. <laughs> um, she's trying to rescue the idea of the mass strike from its connection to what we've already kind of come across as the conspiratorial, blanquiest strain of socialist and anarchist strategic and political thinking, whereby um, by, by, by some kind of like... Um, well, there's very strange, aren't there? There is the kind of like, can you orchestrate the mass uh, strike in such a way that you can, from a small base, accelerate very rapidly into a movement? And she makes this critique that um, advocates of the sort of anarchist version of the mass strike are trying to jump to a point much further along the road. They're trying to like jump to the social revolution when the sort of like the material basis for that within society hasn't been built at all. And clearly she's much more in this strain of Marxist political thinking where there's a lot of political work and build up that needs to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I like how she calls it, what does she say? She has a zinger line where she's like, far from, you know, the events in 1905 Russia as, you know, saying, as, uh, what's the word, like, uh, complimenting the anarchist vision. She's like, this is the historic liquidation of anarchism. <laughs> oh, right, jeez. That was like the third page. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, it's true, it's true, it's true. Yeah, and, but, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but, and, yeah, and it's sort of the other, the other aspect of it much more related to sort of anarchist thinking as one would recognize it is this idea that almost like waiting just below the surface of capitalist society waiting innately within all human beings is this desire to revolutionize and change social life and social existence it's in an, it, it's it's only t it only needs a small push and innate human nature will emerge and human beings will suddenly live differently. So in the sort of anarchist conception of the mass strike, it's like a single event where mm. you sort of flip the switch, society flips the switch and decides to act radically differently to the way it has acted previously. Yeah. Um, yeah. And obviously she is, again, much more uh, with the general strain of social democracy as it existed at the time where yeah. sort of this work needs to be done i think it's yeah it's really interesting because I, right now like as we speak dan we are seeing like such a for for our lifetimes like such an enormous wave of strikes going on right now in the united states specifically and of course like historically they're not like massive or anything right when you compare them but like when you bring up that idea of like within everybody there are these innate ideas of like okay we need to like change everything dude like obviously i think that we kind of uh, identify a lot more with how she kind of phrases that because like if you look at you know we were talking about the IATSE strike the other day and it's like you have a lot of chuds working in IATSE right a lot of like Trump guys or whatever or just main, you know people who don't vote people who don't care but it's like 98% of people that voted and it, which like uh, over 90% of people voted voted to strike because you know everybody gets it you know what I mean um and, you know, you're right to to kind of, like, compare that to, like, the anarchist division, because I think she says in here something along the lines of, like, anarchists just kind of believe that, like, goodwill and courage is all you need to, like, get the movement going. And she's just like, wow, no. <laughs> she's just like, wow, no. But then also, on the other side of it, this is a very typical uh, everyone's an idiot except for me text, because she says that, like, there is also the other side, which is, like, the people who are kind of, like, believe that they're the vanguard at the top of the party, at the top of the social democrats who believe that they can, they're the ones who can just go, mass strike right now, we're organized enough, everybody do it, and then we'll do the revolution. And she basically says, it's kind of the same thought between the anarchists and the social democrats who believe they can do it. And so then she goes on to make an argument in this whole thing of like, it's material circumstances, dude, that's what you need to wait for. Yeah, she almost talks, I can't remember the specific word that she uses, but she kind of describes it as a kind of like police mentality, mm. whereas the right or the 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 police and the police state would believe that um, all mass socialist and revolutionary agitation has sort of like somebody behind the scenes directing it. Yeah. And it's almost like the it anarchist, but, the in parti but, but particularly the kind of like, the right in this instance, the sort of Marxist or even like this 
I hesitate to call it Marxist because this is the yeah. point when the sort of yeah, like yeah. the right of social democracy is sort of beginning to break away. Um, but they, yeah, therefore, there the right also has this kind of like police conception of what it means to have a strike kind of thing. Somebody yeah. could just like call it. Yeah, I did really appreciate too, I think like the nuance in that analysis as well, because she does say that like looking at, and she does a lot of historical analysis here of like really breaking down where these strikes happened in 1905 in Russia and what their outcome was and what the impetus was. And she does say like there are, um, you know, instances where in Russia mass strikes were called by the party and they did have, you know, successful economic ends. Um, so she is saying that like it can't happen. But I think that the point that she's making is like when the party calls these strikes, they're successful only on like an individual and very concrete basis, right? They're re the, the party in that case is really good to like identify where there's some contempt for the current situation and where things are just about to break out. And I think she says to give cue for and the direction to the fight to regulate the tactics for the political struggle in every phase. So it's, you know, she's not just having this move, this idea that I think is really often attributed to her, which is just pure spontaneity. She's saying that's like the anarchist belief. And yeah, I guess I just really appreciated her saying that like the party is still extremely important and can make large changes. It's just that kind of like concrete versus abstract, uh, uh, dichotomy mm, mm. Yeah. I don't know. yeah yeah she does she just she's basically um she basically implies that it's it's up to the masses whether they decide to act or not kind of thing yeah and material social circumstances on the ground determine that and not um one well i, I guess one what kind of directions or directives the 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 party or the trade union uh leadership want to give but also like it's not even dependent on necessarily how large or well organized the working class is it's much more predicated on um sp specific social and economic conditions in all in every instance and whether the masses that masses are willing to make that move whether there's any desire or impetus or grievance that's stark enough for them to want to do that but at the same time she's implying that it's something that scales right like you can she's, she's basically comparing russia to germany right and she's talking about the mass strike in the context of the 1905 russian revolution mm -hmm. and suggesting that the proletariat of russia have demonstrated to the broader international proletariat a new strategy and tactic um something which is emergent from the development of the class struggle how the class is, is how the class is developing its own tactics and strategies that are appropriate to whatever stage of ca capitalism that we now find ourselves in at that mm -hmm. period of time um and so the sort of crossover is like russia has developed or is sort of like um, demonstrating this new strategy and then she's trying to apply it across to her own context in Germany and how it might be applied in that context and the kind of resistance both internal and external to the organized labor movement how that resistance is pushing back or what it would take for it to adopt the mass strike strategy as mm -hmm. it were um well, I guess what she was saying is like in Germany, you can have a really well organized labor movement, and there can be at any point in time a huge number of really combative sites of struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, really intense strike waves, but they don't become mass strikes in that they don't inspire in other places, um, in other parts of the proletariat, some kind of like solidaristic reaction, right? What's happening is in Russia is certain places are demonstrating the legitimacy of the tactic, they're winning gains, and it's sort of like the strategy or the possibility of political and economic resistance to both the autocratic organization of the state, but then also the capitalist or the nascent capitalist organization of the economy, the mm -hmm. possibility of resistance to that system becomes more and more visible. Yeah. And it kind of like is something which catches and spirals and there is this sort of like 
growth in um, strike action. That's mm. why it's not like the mass strike is a single strike on a single day or even a str- single prolonged period. It's this extended wave of actions which build upon themselves in the heat of a broader revolutionary phase. She mm-hmm. says that like it's not the mass strike which causes the revolution, right? It's the revolution which makes possible the strategy of the mass strike. Yeah. Um, and therefore, no matter how how intense any individual instance of a strike and also no matter how well organized the labor movement well may be if you don't get this sort of proliferation of strikes and if you don't get this sort of like solidaristic outpouring then you can't have you can't develop toward a sort of mass strike as revolutionary strategy yeah yeah no absolutely and i I think it's interesting too when she says that like this st- quote unquote strategy insofar as I guess that like it is something that can be planned and game theoried out right of the mass strike is like kind of like the the impulse of the working class right like something like it's very like knee jerk like things are bad they need to change mass strike this is just like the main thing that can happen or that we can make happen and it's definitely worth noting that like while that is extremely impulsive and what you're saying, like the mass strike is something where it inspires in other people this possibility, hey, we can do something about this, that like a future for that movement is really kind of only imagined, and this is the role like in a party, right? Like you need to have like the party to kind of say, okay, you know, here's what needs to get done, but also like, here's what we're working towards. And it's this idea of like the social Democrats, as you would call them back then, of being the people who are like, you know, in like a very like McNairist idea fashion as well, like we're against everything, we're for this, here's what we're for, uh, here's what we can harness this energy to do, and we are the organ that takes the political power to do that. And again, she makes this distinction between like the economic power of like the mass strike or the trade unions or something like that, and the political power of the party, which can kind of only really be wielded in the party, um, a class independent party, obviously, as well. Um, I, it's it's kind of a bummer because, like, you see, I don't know, reading this really gave me a, like, different understanding of, like, maybe not understanding, but just, like, a different way of thinking about her death <laughs> because it's, like, she she spends all of this talking about, okay, guys, we need to be ready for, like, ready for anything, but also, like, the material circumstances have to exist and, you know, this mass strike might break up into a bunch of little petty economic uh arguments which is good and etc cetera, etc cetera. um it really kind of adds weight to her and carl leave next death when she was just very much like this isn't the time this isn't time to do it but at the end of the day you know she did it and she went along with the revolution and um paid for it with her life pretty gnarly but um yeah mm. and she was betrayed by representatives of the party yeah that's which in this essay she lords yeah. i mean there are some references to like party officialdom and how it sort of becomes potentially reactionary or holds back the workers movement kind of thing but um for the most part yeah as you say the 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 social democratic party fulfills a very specific role in this at the end she quotes from the communist manifesto referring to the communists i.e the social democrats as being the people who sort of maintain this vision Mm -hmm. for the emancipation of the proletariat writ large or in its totality kind of thing um i wonder if that's like something that we as communists have ever like really kind of come to terms with that that happened in germany because i think that like as much as i've been enjoying the mcnair like you you get a feeling where it's like is this what we're working towards again or is it like i don't know like i don't know Mm-hmm. It's just—is it something mm-hmm. that we've grappled with at all yet? Yeah, I guess we'll see. Yeah, in my, as I was reading this text, I was sort of like thinking about the left in this context and thinking about the right, mm-hmm. and I kind of sort of like lost the concept of the center somewhere in the mix, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, you mean the left and the right of like the broader political? Spectrum? Yeah, you want to know of the communist of, movement, okay, I guess, okay. in the sense that like this text is very. Um, very much committed to the idea of social revolution Mm. um it's committed to 
uh, sort of non-reformist conception of how you transition and move towards socialism. It puts a sort of reckoning with the capitalist class and the state apparatus of a capitalism or in the Russian context of autocracy. Um, it sort of centers that revolutionary reckoning, I suppose. Mm. Um, and in her references to, in a sort of like limited references at the end of the piece to the bureaucratization of the trade union movement and to some extent the party and how it's becoming, how there are, obviously she refers throughout to um, like people on the right of the party. Bernstein gets a few mentions kind of thing. Um, so the sort of the right and the left feel very present in this. Um, and obviously the, the the sort of center tendency as it's described by McNair isn't spoken of very broadly or il illuminated specifically, but it was just, I was more thinking about the precarity of towing that line, I suppose, yeah. between sort of like having a relationship to, like standing in elections, having a relationship to the state, playing to some extent a reformist role, but then also not slipping into full reformism, still having one eye on mm. revolution when the specific day comes and how you sort of like constantly continue to build toward that end whilst all your day-to-day -day operations are within a sort of like bourgeois democracy and the capitalist state and the capitalist system generally. Kind of yeah. Thing. I mean, it's fr I don't think I've come to terms with really any of the um, tendencies because it's like... You know, as much as I appreciate the Marx stuff that we came across in um, the Shlomo and in and you know, kind of Rosa Luxemburg in this, like the ideas of any revolution needing to be that works needing to be a social revolution. Like I think I'm fully on board with that idea, but like I'm you know obviously not comfortable with the like just waiting you know till the circumstances are right. But then also like. I'm not comfortable with revisionism, not comfortable, like, and even, you know, the center tendency, quote unquote, like with McNair, again, it's like either we're working towards what has already kind of not worked, or this is the best possible thing that we can do right now, which is kind of what I think. But then it's also like, again, it's just a waiting game, isn't it? It's, you know, a long term strategy. I've been getting into a little bit of doomerism recently with the climate, Dan, and like, uh, I don't know. I don't. I think that's just led me to not be super comfortable with any of these tendencies, but also kind of comfortable with them all because yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of like I can't think of anything else to try that we haven't already tried. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's just like I, don't know, I just wait for the circumstances, I guess. But, yeah. Mm. Yeah, fair. yeah, I was and I'm sort of broadly on board with the strategy of patience such that I understand it intellectually. I mean, mm. how it plays out in my <laughs> politicking in day-to-day -day life i have no idea um but i suppose when i slip into worry and despair or what have you i have a tendency to slip toward slip back toward a degree of reformism the kind mm. of the person the person within me who had hopes for what might be achieved by the labor party left mm. to some extent should they gain power in the country not just in the Labour Party kind of thing. Like, I know that I have this tendency back towards sort of quote-unquote reformism, I suppose. Um, what did you call it the other day? Your blue Labour tendencies? <laughs> Uh-oh, here we go. Um, and I think, I think we could abstract this problem into one which is um, easily applicable to our comp our present circumstance right which is basically just how do you be a revolutionary today yeah like yeah well that's you the do it versus without, abstract isn't it without falling back without running the risk of either falling into falling back into being a liberal mm. or i don't know quote, quote unquote liberal i don't know yeah, whatever. Well, or like or like there's another kind of like fatalistic doomerism, which is kind of represented to some extent, I think, by the the ultra left. Yeah. Like the like something I'd like to come on to in future, but it, I suppose it has reference in this in the sense that um, 
Rosa Luxemburg is very optimistic about the revolutionary potential of the masses. Um, as one ought be, if one is a Marxist. <laughs> one would hope. I suppose. Or <laughs> if one wants to pursue an orthodox Marxist strategy. If one wants to give... Sp spread democratic power to everybody in society. One would hope that you're mm -hmm, optimistic mm -hmm, about that. Mm -hmm. But there is something very much like fatalistic in the sort of ultra left tendencies as they exist, like communization or mm -hmm. to some extent even um, strains of like council communism kind of thing. But I'm sort of thinking about communization more broadly, where it's just kind of like everything is put, everything is pegged on the kind of like spontaneous insurrectionary moment yeah. kind of thing. Um, and because of the development of the nature of the proletariat, because of changes in class relations and the way capitalism has kind of like altered the experience and existence of the proletariat under capitalism, um, has this kind of like inspiring vision of the potential of the proletariat that you get in this piece, has that potential disappeared in contemporary capitalism kind of thing. Yeah. So there's another wing of the fatalism that you can slip into kind of thing. Or, mm. um, I don't know. Anyway. I think capitalism has just gotten too good. Too good at what it does. <laughs> Not good for us, obviously, but just too good at what it does. Uh -huh. I mean, it's all going to come crashing down eventually, perhaps quite soon. Not like soon, soon, but like, you know, I don't know. I think, I hate to say it, but I think eventually we're going to have to maybe do some reading on ideology and the role that like, you know, that plays in our everyday lives. It's just because what I brought up earlier, like that question of like, how is it that like, Ayatsi was able to have like 98% yes for a strike. It That like really filled me with hope because it's like, okay, everybody gets it. Everybody gets it. Everybody has these stupid culture war things that goes on in their mind that's just fake and that, you know, it's just, it's just ways to keep you mad. But like, everybody does get it. You know what I mean? And like, if you keep it to the basics of like, we're against the current way of things, wage labor bad, here why, uh, falling rate of profit, hear why. Hopefully you could, you know, I get everybody to listen to and ignite that spark that everybody has inside, I guess. Mm -hmm. Hopefully mm -hmm. one would hope. But we'll see. One thing I didn't, I would like to come on to with this piece, getting back to it, is she said something later on, kind of towards the end, that I'm either misunderstanding or I just don't agree with. She's bringing up this distinction of, like, the relationship between trade unions and the Social Democrats, Right. Um, and she kind of says that, like, without getting into the kind of, like, bureaucratic tendencies of both of these organizations, but specifically the trade union movement, she kind of says that, like, they both need each other, right? The Social Democrats need the trade unions for the, like, concrete economic struggle that's going on in everybody's everyday lives. But then she kind of says, this is the thing that I either don't understand or I don't agree with, because she says that the trade unions need the social democrats. And I wonder if history has kind of like not vindicated that really at all, because like I can't think of really many trade unions that like need need too much. Like if the Democratic Party taking the turn that it has ever since the end of World War II has shown us anything, it's that like you can kind of just be like a Republican, but nominally a Democrat and really be anti-labor, but, like, still kind of, like, I don't know, be a part of the trade union movement? Like, I don't know, the trade union movement now is just so ossified and so, like, exclusionary that, like, I don't know, what do they need? Obviously, they need some kind of political support, but she says that it would be, what does she say? She says, any att attempts to emancipate the trade unions from social democratic theory in favor of some other trade union theory opposed to social democracy is, from the standpoint of the trade unions themselves in their future, nothing but an attempt to commit suicide. I think it's safe to say that the Democratic Party, which I suppose in America is maybe the people protecting what trade unions now exist, they're not social <laughs> democrats, you know what I mean? So, like, I don't know. What do you think about that in terms of has that not been vindicated at all? I don't really know what um, a trade union inspired by social democratic theory is compared to mm. a trade union inspired by some other type of thinking. Mm. Um, I mean, in, in the specific historical context in which she's speaking, she's talking about this sort of like conception of the trade unions and the party being kind of co-equals. Yeah. And she's sort of su suggesting that's kind of like a piece of theory which is I don't know perhaps reactionary or perhaps at least associated with 
the right and the reformist right. Or at least just anti-revolutionary, and I suppose. Anti-revolutionary, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's particularly in this last chapter of this essay where she's laying into the trade unions as the <laughs> sort of like most specific example of the kind of bureaucratization of the representation of labor and how it's sort of, I guess, for, st- for stalling or directly opposed to both spontaneity, but also like input from the masses and rather thinks of itself as like the legitimate directors of the, not even going to say class struggle because I don't even yeah. know whether they wanted to think in those terms kind of thing. Mm. Um, maybe that's the difference, right? Whether you're a trade union that's inspired by the concept of class struggle or whether you're a trade union which is much more like corporatist in its outlook, I suppose, mm. as trade unions became in the 20th century. Yeah. Um, in terms of that specific context, she's generally saying that like, although the trade unions have this significantly larger membership than the Social Democrats do, she's sort of saying historically, like the trade unions owe their existence to the Social Democrats. The Social Democrats made the trade unions, for one, but also they sort of, through their political um, activism, they sort of built up this consciousness in a big number of the working class of Germany in that sort of like led to the first sort of like members of trade unions. But then also she's saying like, why would people be part of both institutions? And yeah. clearly, if you only wanted to sort of pay dues to one organization, you would pay it to the trade union, right? Yeah. Um, and she's saying that like, the the social democrats in their political struggle, in their participation in elections, provoke and inspire a sort of degree of consciousness in the cert- the more organized members of the working class, the more class consciousness members of the or- of the working class, and those sort of organized and class conscious members move into the trade union movement and make up its bulk kind of thing. So she's sort of suggesting that like, although the trade union bureaucracy is moving away from social democratic thinking and towards sort of bureauc- bureaucratization and reformism and what have mm-hmm. you, um, the the mass of the trade union movement is much closer to the sort of mainstream of social democracy and feels an affinity toward social democracy, which in this context means socialism slash communism. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's funny to see that in the context of like 1919, right? And how yeah. that revolution goes and how the majority of the masses stay with the social democrats and don't... Um, don't ally themselves directly with the communist split from the social democratic party but yeah it's interesting right she doesn't she describes it as like a a, a two pyramids on top of each other if i was getting her mm-hmm. comparison correct where she's like it seems like it's one mass but then the apexes are wildly apart right yeah at the at the base at the base where the sort of average social democratic voter and trade union member exists there is this union between Mm -hmm. like unionism and social democracy but as you get toward the sort of like furthest corners like as you as you ascend the sort of bureaucracy of the two organizations like the bureaucracy of the trade unions and the leadership of the social democrats like diverge wildly kind of thing yeah it's funny because this is this is one of the first ideas we came across doing the show almost a year ago oh is actually you know what yeah, Dan, it's our year, twitter yeah. anniversary that oh I don't say really nice. very odd um <laughs> i was like should i do the tweet where it's like it's my one year and i was like no <laughs> <laughs> um but this is one of the first ideas we came across in the miller band about like uh trade union bureaucracy and like how can you like get around this idea of uh they, these institutions kind of only being in it uh, only conceiving of the movement in its own terms, in terms of, like you see in America, of trade unions only really caring about wages these days, you know what I mean? Um, or like workplace safety or stuff like that. And this is a really interesting kind of like, not solution to that problem, but it's nice to know that while there could be this like bureaucratic, just like, uh, like stuck in the mud, not going anywhere, like, uh, there's a word for this. I'm forgetting it. I can't think any good words today. This bureaucratic just like sluggishness at the top that's only interested in like eh, uh, continuing itself. God, I'm not making myself <laughs> clear. But um, it's good to know that like what Rose Luxemburg is saying here that like 
the revolutionary potential isn't there. The revolutionary potential is in the base, and it's kind of always there. And the, the mass strike, as she calls it, is like a opening up of all of that energy and releasing it periodically. And I thought it was also interesting that she was like, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is obviously right after 1905, right? But she's like, yeah, this isn't always going to result in socialism, right? She's like, inevitably, actually, most of these are just going to wind up decaying, I guess, or just like slowing back down into a series of economic strikes and going back into the trade union for this, you know, economic struggle as opposed to the political struggle. Um, yeah. It's interesting. That's been something, oh, just to say, that's been something I've been thinking about ever since we read the Miliband, that like bureaucratic rot kind of thing. It's interesting. Yeah. I guess in that, that description of um, social democracy in Germany as a sort of upturned pyramid kind of thing, um, it might be one of those things to see in its historic context. And I don't know how that exists now in terms of like the consciousness of the mainstream of trade mm. union membership kind of thing. I guess in, in the case of Viazzi, I suppose you could say that like, um, there is this grassroots grievance, which is, um, at least self-evident and, um, entirely justified for the people at the base of that trade union. Um, and that is the kind of sort of like, um, the kind of like, spark which is meant to light a sort of mass strike wave mm. in the sense that like um the impetus is not coming from the top saying now this now that kind of thing but rather yeah. there is this sort of like uh, swelling sense of grievance from below kind of thing mm. um and i mean in her context she says sometimes it's inspired by a economic grievance and then it moves through the development of the consciousness of the people involved into something that's much more full of political demands sometimes it starts with a series of political demands as she describes 1905 beginning and it sort of fractures into this series of um economic strikes one of the things that i thought was really interesting about this essay was this union of sort of the political and the economic and how yeah. she's describing this as an awesome um oscillation i almost said ossification oscillation <laughs> between like Ossification, that's sort of. Thinking. Yeah. That's why it's in my head because I was <laughs> <laughs> trying to complete your sentences with that one. Um, there is this sort of like transition between a, a sort of movement going through these economic and political phases. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up was to think about McNair's language of the sort of like uh, positive and negative claims of the left or the Marxist left. And we've kind of talked about the negative claim, right? And I feel like Rosa Luxemburg kind of um, endorses it to some extent, the negative claim being that, like, this de there is this gradual development of sort of bureaucratization and um, sort of, like, co-option of mass spontaneity by individuals at the top of parties and at the top of trade union movements. She kind of gets around it, though, a bit. Like, she is able to kind of, like, say that without just purely having the negative claim. Of, like, yeah, it's not a, like, this is inevitable. And the way McNair sort of demonstrates it as being, like, or describes it as being, like, the left thinks this is inevitable of yeah. parties and trade unions and blah, 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 blah. Obviously, Rosa Luxemburg is, Rosa Luxemburg is fully ensconced within the mainstream of social democracy, or at least in the party and... um is is still in dialogue with its constituent parts and is sort of part of that movement and there's, it's not a split from that movement mm -hmm. yet i suppose yeah um but the other thing i kind of wanted to talk about was the kind of like positive claim right because the way mcnair describes it is being that like the mass strike leads to people sort of like using the threat or the sort of like the shutting down of the economy as a way to sort of like institute the minimum program of social democracy now maybe there are hints of that idea in this essay although they're not really there mm -hmm. but what i sort of what i sort of identified as being the positive claim of luxembourg right is like the mass strike is essential to building the consciousness of the working class yeah and it kind of relates also to this concept this idea that she's thinking about of like for any revolutionary moment for any um, successful revolutionary strategy you have to have this conception of like you have to unite both organized and 
non-organised workers, right? You can't just rely on the organised working class. You have to light a sort of spark. You have to provoke the masses um, more broadly. Mm. And I think that's something that um, I suppose we could think about. I, I mean, I think it is applicable to our contemporary moment, I suppose. But also it's kind of applicable to her... It demonstrates her critique of the right, but it also might stray into what she might be critiquing in the centre in the sense of like having a revolutionary strategy, which is you just build the organisation, you build the consciousness, you build you build toward having a majority of workers be on board kind of thing. And she's sort of suggesting that that's not possible and that it takes these revolutionary moments and it takes um, revolutionary moments in which the mass strike is a key part to play this role of both spreading consciousness to the workers, but then also uniting both the organized and non-organized members of the class into yeah. a revolutionary movement. Well, I think she's, I think she isn't saying that it's not possible. I think that she's saying that it's necessary for these movements, if that makes sense. Like, I think she's saying that, you know, okay, if we just think about it, like, what is more impactful on working class consciousness? A moment where everybody in IATSE is like, holy shit, this sucks, dude. We're being taken advantage of. Or just, like, the constant kind of, like, pay your dues. Okay, we'll give you more of this. Which isn't what, like, that's a trade union thing, right? That isn't what the social democrats do. I think that it is still necessary to, like, build up that movement and have that slow movement. I mean, I think that she would probably say that, like, that is the vanguard of the working class. Those are, like the people who are kind of like at the front lines who have this developed consciousness, but that it does take, even if it's, it isn't like this has to happen. It's like, this is hugely uh, beneficial for the working class to have these big moments of like uproar in class consciousness. And yeah, it, she does say that that is like necessary to breed its consciousness because you can't just have this vanguard and expect them to do the revolution. It has to be everybody, which I think I, I think I hundred percent agree with mm -hmm. quite frankly. I mean, like you can have, revolutions that are nominally socialist just with the vanguard but where's that gonna go i guess yeah, yeah i guess what i kind of come back to was what i was hinting at before was that like to this essay the concept of revolution seems central to the strategy yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like you cannot you cannot develop this strategy you you have to be in a revolutionary moment for the mass strike strategy to help inspire and build the consciousness of the working class such that it is in a position to, I mean, take over the running of society eventually. But it might take, like, a, yeah, a I lot mean, of them. Like the, yeah, a must, a must, a, yeah, we're talking about, like, a really long wave. Yeah. This, is the, this is one of the problems that I, like, this is one of the things that I queried kind of thing was this sense of, like, for what length of time... I mean, I guess this is coming back to McMahon's critique, right? But it's, like, over a longer period of time rather than... Not for how long can the working class, such as it was able, how long could it shut down society for and what would the results of that be? But rather like how long could a revolutionary way of go on um, in the fashion that she describes yeah. before it either collapses or is resisted or mm -hmm. before it Entry. just sort of like collapses the functioning of society, I suppose. Yeah. Um, well, let me just say, I, I don't know if that is what she's saying. I don't know. Well, at least maybe it's not what I took this to mean like mm -hmm. i think that she's saying more so it isn't just going to be this one long sustained uh mass strike it could be right but she's saying that like these things come and go and they come in waves and like the thing that is much more impactful on class consciousness isn't the long-term building up it is these brief moments of just upsurge right it's like it's the idea that we came across again in the middle band of the like liberal versus marxist view of conflict like there is no kind of coming to terms with the conflict between the ruling class and the working class, it all has to be broken. And it eventually will get broken in one of these upsurges, but it's up to the party to, first of all, see which one of these upsurges is the real one and use that political moment, use that economic moment, I guess, for two political ends. So it isn't so much of like, I don't think what McNair is saying of like, how long can this go on for? Because he's right. If your strategy is just a mass strike and then we do that's, you know, we hold out until, you know, whenever, He's right. That can't happen. But it is this idea of like 
many of these will happen and you need both. You need the party and you need this big, large movement. That's kind of what I took it to mean, I guess. Yeah. yeah. She good. I'll say <laughs> it. She good. I like it. Um, where are we at with this? Um, yeah, I wrote down that idea of like, this is where, I think she said this is like where you get troops for the struggle is in these movements. I really, really appreciated that because that's kind of like where, yeah, I don't know. Isn't there some kind of Marx quote or something? You can bend any Marx quote to whatever you want, but it's like there's that quote where it's like a million uh, effing, you know, documents is only worth like one big thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's obviously not that. But like a thousand programs is worth. Yeah, once. Yeah, well, that was in the slow-mo, wasn't it? Yeah. Like one, yeah, one moving the, the class one step is more important than whatever a thousand programs yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I really will, I think, stick by like, I came into this thinking we were going to get a lot of the spontaneity and that's all. It's just the spontaneity, dude, which in my mind is it's kind of just anarchism. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, I think I came away with this with more of, I guess, a nuanced understanding of the role of the party even, which I was kind of surprised by, and the role, obviously, of class consciousness. One of these days I'm going to figure out what dialectical means because I want to use it correctly, but it felt dialectical. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. One of the things that I was thinking, what I well, one of the things that I quite enjoyed or appreciated, and this is sort of coming back to the both the the central position of revolution to the strategy, but also trying to pass out what the sort of like centrist strategy is as a relation to the left and the right strategy. There's a bit in the beginning of the last chapter of this where she's kind of talking about um, the workers' movement as it exists in bourgeois society. Mm. And the trade union movement that we have or that they had at the time and the party as they had it at the time were effectively bourgeois institutions, right? Or at least like they were operating within the cap a sort of stable running of the capitalist system. And so like the, the trade union movement becomes represent sort of like trade unions representing either certain specific sections of the working class and a strike in one place doesn't necessarily inspire a strike in other places because mm. it's only about specific grievances in specific locations and like strikes can m maintain localized and it just becomes sort of like the interaction between the working class and the the bourgeois class as part of the sort of general running of capitalism. And at the same time, the Social Democratic Party operates within uh, parliamentarism and therefore it has this kind of like reformist general reformist existence mm. um and so i was just sort of thinking about the role of the party and the role of the trade unions being something that's defined by existence within bourgeois society when you're not in this revolutionary movement and yeah. when she's talking about like bringing together social democracy with the working with the the trade union movement it's kind of like in this revolutionary moment all things become possible. Things are up in the air. New consciousness is developing. New strategies are happening. Mm. Sort of like there's just like history is at work kind of thing. And it's at that point that like things come into play and you can have this synthesis. It's almost like that's at the point when you can sort of like go back to this sort of like merger, for, merger formula and you yeah. can sort of start to then bring together again like the, cl the conscious elements with the sort of like non-organized members of the working class kind of thing as this sort of this revolutionary upsurge is taking place. And I think, I guess a lot of, a lot of what we're talking about in these various discussions of strategy is like, what do you do in non-revolutionary times and how do you prepare for revolution? Yeah. And that like, well, obviously the cent obviously the center doesn't recognize it. No, obviously the right doesn't recognize the necessity of revolution. Mm. Obviously for Luxembourg, it's, almost everything and obviously the party has this role to play in non-revolutionary times and in revolutionary times and i guess in the context of the the center as well there's this question of like how is the center conceptualizing itself as preparing for revolution when it comes maybe there's slightly less emphasis on spontaneity and slightly more emphasis sure. on building consciousness and institution and but also just like provoking a clash with the state right whether that's through winning a majority in parliament mm. or i don't know something I mean, that'd be cool yeah <laughs> i mean it's you're absolutely right i mean i think that's kind of why it's important to read this as you're saying like a historical document because she very first bit 
is her saying, here's the discourse as it exists in my time. Um, and here's what I got to say about it right here, right now. Um, and so, you know, she's saying that, like, the mass strike has been written off by everybody, right? But after 1905, hey, let's do a little bit more thinking about that. And I think I've kind of come away from this with the understanding that it is not a strategy at all. Mm -hmm. It is the strategy is what you do with the mass strike and how you're able to build up your forces in times where these upsurges are not happening to then better be able to kind of do strategy when that time is necessary. And I think for like a very gritty look into like what you do, um, other than obviously the McNair in these downtimes, it's like, or at least what happens in these downtimes is the most recent Hal Draper that we read about sex, because it's just like, you know, this is kind of exactly what he was saying in these downtimes. This is just what's going to happen. But do your best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If any kind of revolutionary moment comes, we cannot be disadvantaged by having more conscious socialist revolution yeah. in the world. Yeah. And it's like, hey, if you can work towards like having a parliamentary majority or something, why not? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. would be cool. <laughs> why not? Um, and it is interesting kind of how we relate to this idea of like the abstract revolutionary time periods versus the more concrete, like, okay, what do we got to do right here, right now as an individual? Because it is kind of like, it's almost freeing because it's kind of like, it is just do your best and think about where you are. And like, I don't know, I'm obviously not part of any revolutionary political party or anything like that, but like. I don't know, just talking to people that you know and, like, doing your best to kind of, like, shift attitudes away from the kind of, like, uh, uh, Labour Party traps or the Democratic Party traps that exist. Um, or, hey, if you are, like, belong to a union that has, like, some sway at your workplace, eh, you know, why don't you do a little bit of work with your union, do some more organizing. So if you're into politics, do that. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm comparing everything to the concrete versus abstract uh uh relationship that yeah i think that's one of the more kind of useful ideas that i've come across since we started doing the show just for my own thinking about like the single kind of entity with entity within a system versus the emergent whole and understanding that things are not always the sum of their parts and that that emergence is like extremely important just being able to kind of like have that way of looking at things that you can kind of like apply to any systems. Like it is almost just systems theory, right? It's almost like that's why it was developed to be able to think about things like this. But um, yeah, it's good and it's useful. <laughs> and it comes up a lot as I think you see by me saying it. Um, overall, I really enjoyed this, Dan. Yeah. I'm really glad we, we read this and I think we should come back to some more stuff. Rosa Luxemburg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to walk through the the main texts i suppose yeah. <laughs> and we should also have a look at the right too just for no other reason than to kind of be like huh yeah 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 yeah, yeah i'd like to do that mm -hmm. yeah because it's like i can see why it had appeal sure i can oh, yeah. see why it has appeal now even mm -hmm. but i can particularly see why it had appeal in that period of time right like um we are building it seemed like the social democrats were building toward a parliamentary majority to be in a, in a position to um, make significant reforms to the capitalist system and also like why the desire to like be a legitimate force within society and sort of yeah. within the system in which you find yourself in and they didn't have historical hindsight like we do now. Quite. We can yeah, just go, oh, the Nazis yeah, yeah. came after that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, oh, okay. Yeah, first you get World War One, then you get... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, then you get the various putches, and then eventually you get <laughs> 1933. And... I, would, I would like to have a better understanding of kind of what communists were doing post-World War One, in between that period of uh -huh. the World Wars, um, in, in Germany specifically, and also in Italy. Um, that's just what's going on. Mm -hmm. But yeah, to, to the reformists, I feel like Bernstein gets lit up by everybody. So it'd be interesting. I don't know. Well, he's got to have something going for him. So it'd be interesting to figure out what that is. We have read Bernstein for the show before. Uh -huh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> his history of Oliver Cromwell, his chapter on Oliver Cromwell. Um, or Jared Winstanley. 
Yeah. Was it yeah. on Cromwell? Or was I think it was on it? Cromwell, and then he was kind of like, and yeah, also here's what was going on with yeah, the yeah, levelers yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah. Gerard Wynn Stanley, easily King. the greatest anarchist of all time. <laughs> easily. I think we said recently that most of them should be canceled, uh-huh. mainly Proudhon. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Was Wynn Stanley an anarchist? Yeah, let's just call him an anarchist. Oh, so we right, can okay. have some anarchist comments. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> We are looking to redeem some anarchists. So like, Bookchin has been redeemed. Yeah, we're on board with yeah, Bookchin. That, oh, that, yeah. that introduction in that chapter, <laughs> man, that was great. You know what? We should actually go back to that because I really loved that. Yeah, um, okay. Or we should read some like grumpy old Bookchin in the 90s of like goddamn kids and their lifestyle. Anarchism. Yeah, we could read lifestyle anarchism <laughs> and class struggle anarchism. That's a good laugh. Yeah, yeah. I've read that before. Oh, have you? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Were you ever, did you, did you ever describe yourself as an anarchist? Yeah, for a little while. Really? Yeah. When was that? Um, between this is sort of twenty eleven, okay, twenty twelve. Gotcha, gotcha. Then I discovered very obscure like <laughs> um, uh, structuralist Marxism. Oh, interesting. You know, Althusers and you. Your Althusers. And then sl- sl- <laughs> Slipping into the even more hysterical, <laughs> <laughs> wanted to say esoteric, but maybe I uh, wanted to say hysterical, I don't know. Um, Alain Badiou's and your know, uh, Slavoj Zizek, so we're getting away from Marx, it's now really. <laughs> I, have, I have no idea about Slavoj Zizek, I don't yeah. know anything about him. Um, yeah. so I don't know, I, I like, I like, I like obscure returns. Sure, we should read more of that, <laughs> it's more obscure stuff. <laughs> Um, Things that sound profound, but you're not sure whether you understand them. That's why I like Lacan so much. (laughs) (laughs) I have no idea what this means. Uh, (laughs) But he sounds like he knows what he's talking about. (laughs) Well, you know, we're all just looking for someone that knows what they're talking about. Good luck, listener, finding that. (laughs) Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to talk about in this, but I think we pretty much covered it all. Um... There's a little something in this for everybody, I'll say. Um, and I will say, yeah, read Rosa Luxemburg. She rocks. I mean, yes. this, this was really, really good and really not what I expected at all. And I appreciated it a lot. Yep. Likewise, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, we endorse it. We endorse it. This <laughs> read one, this one. <laughs> yeah, read this one. Yeah. Um, all right. Let us know your favorite Luxemburg essays. <laughs> Luxembourg We'll endeavor to read them. Yeah. Yeah. Is the KPD still a party? Must be. I'm sure there's just, there's some descendants it somewhere. Is, quote unquote. Well, that, yeah. they, they split almost immediately, I think. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Who hasn't? All right. Um, well, next week, Dan, is our Spartacus. We should discuss some Spartacus. We should. We should, we should get a Spartacus. <laughs> we should. <laughs> um, next uh, year, one year anniversary. Next week. Next one week. One year anniversary. God damn it. Next week. One Although, year yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. We got some huge. We, uh, yeah. Let's stop hyping it now. We're supposed to hype it's gonna, it for a while. It's going to we'll, be big. It's, it's yeah. going to be huge. We're going to do an episode. We're, yeah, an episode's going to happen. That's about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been awesome. Um, we'll be back soon with some more of the revolutionary strategy. Um, yeah. And uh, that's the rest All of that sorts out. of stuff. I've got some. I'm cooking up some things in my head. I'm very it's excited. Some stuff. That's exciting. Oh, I'm very excited. All right. Well, uh, I've been Jack, I guess, and uh, I'll see you next week. <laughs> I've been done, I guess. And uh, yeah, join in, join us next week. Thanks for listening all the way to the end. Um, we love you for it. We love you for it. Thank you. See you next week. <laughs>